So we're going to talk about innovation in, uh, in surgery for the next uh, few minutes. Now, <coughs> these are geniuses. Uh, geniuses see something that we all look at every day and see something that nobody saw uh, in those phenomenon. Einstein, of course, uh, the universe, Darwin, uh, evolution, uh, Newton with physical properties of the earth, and Freud, the, uh, the subconscious. There are no geniuses in surgery. Uh, and you'll see when I define innovation, you'll see why there are no geniuses in surgery. The next concept is serendipity. This is Pasteur. And Pasteur, of course, said, uh, chance favors the ready mind. But I couldn't think of any, uh, anything uh, that was serendipity as far as advances in, in surgery. Serendipity are things that happen by accident and then are picked up and uh, viewed by uh, the person that, that encounters this and then develops that into something in surgery. But I couldn't, so if you think of anything that's serendipity in surgery, let me know I couldn't think of anything. The only thing I could think of in our field that was serendipity, of course, is ICSI, where sperm was inadvertently injected into the cytoplasm and they came in the next day and found that an embryo had formed. So what we're going to talk about is innovation. Innovation is very different than those other two concepts in that it's almost a planned move. Uh, it's a plan move. It's a program move as far as accomplishing, uh, as far as accomplishing something. And the best example, of course, is is Jobs. Now, people said that Jobs was a genius, and perhaps he was a genius in some ways. But basically, he was an innovator. He was an inventor, just like uh, uh, Edison. They were inventors, and the term is uh, similar STEM, in that they saw something and was able, we were able to change it and move it on to the next, uh, the next stage. So this is what makes up, uh, this is what makes up uh, innovation. First of all, there has to be a need to change something. So you have to recognize uh, the change. It has to be possible because the technology has to be ready for, to have that, uh, that change. And there always has to be an economic reward. Well, not always, but usually there's an economic reward. There's the production of a product or a change in what we do, uh, and that's what's innovation. Now, we're going to talk about innovations in the future, innovations today, and we're going to talk about some innovations in the past, mostly that uh, did, not, uh, did, not take, uh, did not take hold. But we f before we talk about that, we have to talk about evidence-based surgery. The truth is there's no such thing as evidence-based surgery because surgeons do what they do because they think that it definitely works. So it's hard to get uh, surgeons to uh, accomplish a randomized trial. Uh, I'll give you an example. The uh, American Society of Reproductive Medicine 10 years ago had a protocol for the treatment of endometriosis. There were four arms in the, uh, for mild uh, and moderate endometriosis. One was surgery. Two was Lupron, uh, Depo Lupron. Three was Lupron and surgery. And the fourth was to do nothing, because really to do nothing and, and looking at pregnancy rates. And the, uh, the fact that to do nothing, uh, that's, really the, that's really the key. So the way it went is you operated on a patient, you did a laparoscopy. If you saw endometriosis, you'd call Birmingham, they had a randomization table, and they'd say, okay, surgery. Well, that's great, you do surgery, you believe surgery works, that's fine. Uh, you do another case, and they say Lupron. Well, I don't know if Lupron is as good as surgery, but it's a randomized study. I'm happy to, to not remove the endometrial uh, tissue, the ectopic endometrial tissue, and allow the patient to uh, uh, be treated with depo Lupron. Now, the third case you called up, and they said, do nothing. Well, I'm not going to do nothing because Lupron's okay. Surgery, uh, I think, is better, but I'm not, let somebody else do nothing for their patients. So the study lasted about two weeks because the, the, the randomized arm that made the most sense, nobody would, so would con, uh, conform to. So therefore, evidence-based surgery, so none of the things that we all talk about today or you'll read about in the literature is evidence-based. Uh, is, is evidence, uh, is evidence -based. And this is just looking at the IVF for, as an example of what evidence-based uh, studies are like, where you 
test the hypothesis, you randomize it. We're not going to see that because it doesn't occur uh, in, in, in surgery. Now, right about the time that this revolution occurred in surgery, uh, IVF became uh, available. So uh, the first kind of innovation as far as surgery is concerned is IVF because uh, the introduction uh, of laparoscopy, video laparoscopy by Najat changed the entire field. This was, this was real innovation. And the reason is that other people could share in what you were doing uh, because they had the ability to see what you were doing uh, on, uh, on television. So this changed things. You had assistance that could actually uh, help at, at that point, And it allowed us to do almost uh, most of the things uh, that we're able to do. This is just an oophorectomy uh, in patients that uh, could undergo uh, minimally invasive uh, laparoscopic uh, surgery. So these were innovations that changed what we do as far as surgery is concerned, but it was mainly the invention uh, and perfection of technology that was uh, readily, uh, readily available. So <clears throat> this is something that's disappeared from the armamentarium of the surgeon, and that's a neosalpingostomy. Neosalpingostomy had a high failure rate, a low success rate. IVF makes what works much better in patients that have damaged, uh, damaged uh, fallopian tubes. So although during my uh, residency training we put hoods on fallopian tubes to keep them open, we had various uh, tricks to uh, roll the tube back, uh, success rates were so low and the copic pregnancy rates were so high that that was abandoned. Now that's different than tubal anastomosis. Tubal anastomosis is still something that we do and in the end we'll talk about robotic surgery and this is something, a procedure that we had that innovation, robotic surgery, allows us to perform uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps better. Of course, that's the controversy. Uh, is, th is this better or is it just uh, something that change for change uh, for change sake? Now here's an innovation that disappeared and this is associated with tubal anastomosis and that's operating with the operating microscope. Uh, you can see here, the surgeon actually is looking around the microscope. So at one point it was very uh, trendy, very in to use the microscope. Now, it wasn't all bad. We learned something because using the microscope we got to see tissue that was uh, uh, magnified and allowed us to appreciate tissue much better, kind of like a colposcope. And eventually you could uh, appreciate the lower magnification uh, because you had seen things, you've trained your eye uh, to see things under higher uh, magnification. Surgery in the ovary has changed dramatically because of innovation, but not because of randomized studies. Now, uh, this is the old Buxton stitch to close the ovary. We don't close the ovary anymore. We let it heal by secondary intention. Are there randomized studies comparing uh, one side to the other where a Buxton stitch was done on one side and a, uh, and a ovary was allowed to heal by secondary intention on the other. There are, no, uh, there are no studies that say that, but we all do that now. Everybody lets the ovary heal by secondary uh, intention. And that's a quote, an, that, is a, that is an innovation. And of course, uh, the many procedures have been tried, innovative, creative procedures. Uh, this is uh, fixing the ureter with a laparoscopic uh, approach that has been, uh, that is effective. Uh, and this was something that was tried years ago, uh, doing myomectomies through a mini uh, incision. Obviously this has disappeared uh, because it's much easier to do these uh, myomectomies uh, with, a closed, uh, with a closed laparotomy. And Dr. Octe, uh, who will be speaking here, had an innovative idea to take ovarian tissue and put it into the, uh, into the arm. And you can see here, after a period of time, it began to produce hormones and was effective. And also, an innovative, uh, uh, an innovative idea uh, with uh, perhaps uh, uh, interesting ramifications uh, in the long run. So innovation has changed surgery dramatic dramatically. This is a new and modern uh, operating room with large screens, tele televisions, perhaps the robot, um, laparoscopy, TVs all over the place, uh, columns of, uh, of instruments for recording things and projecting things to distant, uh, distant sites. So the modern, modern, modern operating room looks no, nothing like the operating room 20 years ago. And of course, this is all due to innovation technical change that has made surgery better for the patient and perhaps easier 
uh, easier for the surgeon. Now this is something that we looked at years ago and the idea was to take the laparoscope and put the uh, television screen over the abdomen so instead of operating here and the television was up here perhaps it would be better if the television screen was exactly over the patient as you see uh, as you see here we worked with people at MIT on this well it was a great idea but uh, it wasn't practical it didn't uh, it was hard to manufacture the TV uh, to function in, in, in this way and it didn't really make a significant difference nobody was uh, maybe perhaps we were used to operating here and looking on on the screen over here this didn't make a, a big difference but it was an innovative idea that didn't uh, that didn't catch that didn't catch on now the major one of the major areas of innovation of course is power sources uh, this is the harmonic scalpel I would say it's uh, primary uh, primarily used as a power source today uh, it's kind of I would guess 50 50 with electron uh, uh, with electric current uh, itself but if I would have given this talk 10 years ago I would say the thing to uh, use is the laser uh, the la everybody had lasers we had argon lasers uh, we had YAG lasers we had CO2 lasers and all the surgery we did was utilizing the laser in fact patients would come in and say they wanted laser uh, surgery well, the laser has pretty much, it was an innovative thing. It, uh, it was uh, perhaps cost effective, but it's disappeared uh, as far as most people are concerned, you do, utilizing the laser uh, for laparoscopic surgery. Now there's something new, uh, new is the plasma jet, as you see here. And this rep rep uh, represents tissue damage from the plasma jet. The plasma jet is actually the next step after, after gas, uh, turning this uh, into, a, into a fluid uh, fluid, uh, a fluid power, a fluid power source, and uh, it's it's the new kid on the block. Is this going? Is this innovative enough to change things, uh, or is this something that will disappear like other things? And I think the best example of things that were popular and very current is the laser. And as I mentioned, uh, that's totally uh, disappeared. In fact, people had to be. Uh, it was very difficult to be certified to use the laser in the operating room. Uh, because it was such a, an important thing uh, for gynecologic surgeons to, uh, to employ. Now, another innovation is 3D, uh, is 3D uh, ultrasound. 3D ultrasound is very important in diagnosing Eulerian fusion defects. In fact, it's almost replaced uh, hysterosalpingogram and uh, MRI as far as uh, the diagnosis of these procedures are, are concerned. So 3D, uh, 3D ultrasound, an innovative that, innovation that started with obstetrics, uh, certainly is helpful to, to the gynecologist and the gynecologic, uh, the gynecologic uh, surgeon. And this is just an old Tompkins procedure. You can see the uh, septum uh, in the middle. And uh, based on uh, hysteroscopy, hysteroscopic techniques, better distending media, and uh, ultrasound in order to define uh, what the defect is, uh, these are innovations that have taken hold and we don't do these uh, Tompkins procedures anymore. We don't do open procedures anymore because the closed uh, procedures are just, if not more, uh, effective in treating uh, the, these, uh, these patients. Now fibroids is another area that has very, very, uh, a lot of excitement about it and uh, there are two reasons for that. One, people are beginning to do robotic myomectomies and like I said, we'll talk about robotics uh, at the very end. The other thing is there are multiple drugs now that work to shrink fibroids that make it uh, easier to do the surgery. Fomara, an estrogen uh, inhibitor, uh, is, is one. And of course, GnRH analogs and antagonists uh, are also other drugs that shrink these fibroids. And now on the horizon are the use of sperms, uh, progesterone receptor inhibitors, uh, as well, so it's easier to operate on uh, it's easier to operate on fibroids now because they're smaller, and laparoscopic techniques have improved uh, so that these patients do quite well. If you would have told somebody that you, if you would have told somebody that they could do a my, a large myoma uh, utilizing the laparoscope ten years ago, they would have said that can't be can't be done. It's too bloody, and you won't be able to close the the defect in, in the uterus itself. And obviously, just to, to make the point, 
Uh, myomas are a problem. This looks at pregnancy rates in patients with non-intracavitary fibroids, and you can see that the, the pregnancy rate is decreased, uh, not as significantly as patients with intracavitary lesions, but it's certainly decreased in patients that have intra intramural lesions as well. Now, another innovation uh, was cauterizing fibroids uh, and cooking them through the laparoscope. So with this is a procedure that demonstrates uh, putting a, a coarsened needle uh, into the myoma and cooking it, and you can see the destruction uh, that occurred here. Now, very few people did these cases, uh, and the reason is that the expectation is that it would look like this when you were finished, but the reality is it looked like this, and adhesion formation was quite, uh, adhesion formation is quite high. But now, uh, there's another technique that's gaining popularity throughout the, the country, and this is HIFU. This is highly focused ultrasound to cook fibroids uh, under MRI uh, visualization, and you can see that, uh, you can see that illustrated here. So the interesting part is you don't see the uterus. When we cooked the uh, fibroids with uh, electrocautery, you could see the uterus, what it looked like. I can't believe that it's not the same uh, as far as adhesion formation is concerned as with the old, uh, uh, with uh, electrocautery uh, doing a uh, HIFU. But there are studies where hysterectomies have been done uh, and uh, the uterus is not, doesn't look as damaged as the extreme case that I just showed you uh, on laparoscopy, but the concern is the hysterectomies are done quite uh, quickly after the procedure, and they probably should do hysterectomies after a period of time uh, to allow adhesions uh, or necrosis uh, uh, to occur. Now, imaging, of course, is the place, is the future as far as, uh, uh, as, far as uh, innovation is concerned. Uh, imaging has uh, gone tremend uh, grown uh, tremendously uh, in the last few years and will only, uh, only get better. In fact, one of the things that I think, uh, not in my lifetime, uh, but certainly in the future, all surgery will be done based on imaging. It'll all be invasive surgery, uh, in the sense of radi like an invasive cardiologist, uh, not what we do, minimally uh, in invasive surgery. And one of these things that are interesting is our, 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 our staining tissue. This is just from a Nobel Prize winner uh, four years ago uh, who showed you could stain certain tissues with certain dyes to specifically identify them. And this just looks at the coronary artery and uh, the areas of uh, green, uh, I'm sorry, the areas of red are areas of cholesterol. So you can actually identify uh, where cholesterol is uh, and that will take some uh, meaning in just, uh, just a few minutes. And this is a rat study, you can see the little uh, arms, and these are dyes that are placed in the rat, and the ligand uh, sticks to the tumor. These are bowel tumors, and you can see that on MRI, and the MRI is colorized, uh, that you can see exactly where the tumor is. So just think if we could do this for endometriosis, where you could stain the endometriosis, and know exactly uh, it, where it was, and maybe even treat it externally uh, with, uh, with high foo, with focused, uh, with focused uh, ultrasound. And this is just an MRI of the gut, just showing that it can be colorized, uh, so the tissues do have different colors, just like colorizing uh, a black and white movie, this can be done as well uh, for better uh, imaging. Now this is a vault, this is a nanoparticle, and uh, what can be placed in the nanoparticle is medication, for instance, and then something can open that vault, ultraviolet light, uh, uh, ultrasound. So one thing is uh, you could have this uh, adhere to the coronary artery. These are nanoparticles, and when they get uh, to the coronary artery that's uh, occluded by a cholesterol patch, it could open up and lice it. So this uh, nanotechnology, of course, and actually what they call this are micro-robotics. So this is a form of micro-robotics, and these are little, uh, they look like sperm, but they're really not, they're nanoparticles, and they're able to uh, move uh, with a very small battery, with a flagellar uh, movement, uh, just like a sperm, and get to the point where they're to suppo supposed to go. So just put the last picture together with this picture, uh, a vault connected to the front of this, 
uh, aiming towards the coronary arteries, and you could follow it getting there, and then, of course, opening up the vault with the power, so appropriate power source and reducing it. Now, is this surgery? I don't really, uh, I don't know whether it's surgery or not, but these are innovations to treat things that we treated patients surgically, uh, surgically before. And of course, this is all based on personalized medicine, uh, signal, signaling. Uh, this is Levac, which is a tyrosine uh, activator uh, suppressor, uh, works uh, as a drug to treat leukemia, because the white cells don't, uh, the white cells don't uh, grow. And certainly, as we find out signals in different tissues, uh, and what better example of that is uh, endometrium, uh, ectopic endometrium that has aromatase in it, and we know that from our an aromatase inhibitor works quite well. If we could do, deliver these uh, aromatase inhibitors in high doses to endometriosis, that would be a way to treat those patients uh, without doing uh, uh, laparoscopy, uh, laparoscopy itself. And last, of course, is visual uh, colonoscopy, as you see here. And the other thing, of course, is the camera. You can swallow a camera uh, that goes through the gut and takes pictures uh, all the way, uh, uh, all the way, uh, all the way through. Now, some innovations are good innovations, and some innovations are not good innovations. This is one yet to be judged. This is the single port uh, lapar 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 laparoscope. Uh, I, pri I don't like this uh, innovation. I find it hard to use. Uh, the instruments are constantly at uh, cross purposes, uh, but nevertheless, this is an innovation. People are writing about it, and perhaps it will catch on and is something, uh, and is something viable. It does uh, have the criteria for innovation. It is a change. It might make things better. It's better cosmetically uh, for the patient, one puncture instead of three or four. And of course, if it sells, it has uh, the monetary uh, reward that innovations uh, should definitely have. Three dimension has made a big difference, and this is interesting. We're working with a company now that has, we have three dimensional uh, television for the laparoscope uh, that is not, that we don't have to wear glasses. Uh, when we visualize it. To me, it's not much of a help uh, because I've been operating in two dimensions for a long time. But to younger people, the fact that you have three dimensions, as in the uh, robot, they feel this is a major, uh, a major advantage. So here's something that existed. It turned out to work in the movies, and now it's applicable to surgery, and that's 3D. Another very, very important innovation, I think, uh, is the barb suture, uh, the so-called quill. And uh, just as we talked about making a, uh, a big incision in the uterus, in order to close that incision, it was very difficult to get enough dynamic tension. But now with the quill and the suture being anchored as you uh, begin to put it through, uh, it makes closing the defect in the uterus quite easy in a myomectomy. So I think the quill is a very, very uh, inventive uh, uh, idea, and I think this has a true lasting uh, potential. Now, before we talk about the robot, I want to talk about one other thing, and that's adhesion formation. Of course, adhesion formation is the enemy of the, of the surgeon uh, as far as long-term complications are concerned, pain, uh, bowel obstruction, and for us, uh, infertility. Many things have been tried to prevent adhesions. Uh, me uh, medical therapy has been tried, and barriers ha have been tried. This is Interseed. Interseed has been around for 15 years. It's effective. It's probably the best thing that we have. But people are beginning to look at other things, and this seems to me a ripe area uh, for innovation because uh, there are many chemicals that could uh, be tried. This is hyaluronic acid. Uh, this is ADEPT. And uh, recently, uh, in Fertility and Sterility, Michael Diamond published a study looking at the genes uh, that are associated with adhesion formation. So back to signaling, perhaps if there are genes uh, that could be blocked, uh, that, for, that help to form adhesions, uh, maybe this is the way to attack adhesions, and maybe barrier methods, uh, although they were innovative at their, their time, has come and has, uh, has gone. The other thing, of course, is the use of surgical uh, uh, hemostats. It's hard to read, uh, surgiflow, but surgiflow is, is, is a gelatinous thrombin, and uh, this too, I think, uh, is used as a hemostat, would also make an excellent uh, adhesion, uh, an adhesion barrier. So now, in closing, let's turn our attention to the robot. This is the, uh, the big innovation uh, of, uh, of now. The robot has been approved by the FDA for the last, uh, for seven years. 
it has some uh, tremendous advantages, robotic surgery. Uh, people can watch it all over. Uh, you can do robotic surgery from your office, even though uh, the operating room is five floors uh, below. But basically, it has two real advantages. One is three dimension, and the other is the manual, the ability to move your hand in 300, uh, or your instrument in 360 degrees, just like your, you can move your hand. So it makes the surgery much easier. Also, I also like it because it divides the plane. The instruments aren't uh, crossing uh, over. And this is just a list just to show what's been tried with the use of the robot. Uh, the two big areas today are in GYN oncology and um, and the use of lymphadenectomy and in uh, reproductive endocrinology and tubal anastomosis. Other things have been tried, uh, but basically those are the two things that have the most fans. Now, I'm going to show you just uh, three slides uh, with data, um, and uh, they're busy slides, and the important thing is that uh, they all have the same message. Uh, these are studies that are but not randomized, these are studies where in an institution they've tried uh, both ways and then they just get ret uh, retrospectively uh, compare the outcome. And the bottom line for this study, uh, for this study, vaginal hysterectomy versus vaginally assisted robotic hysterectomy, and uh, this study for radical cancer, basically it shows that the old way is as good as the new way, and in some aspects the new way is a little bit better, uh, less blood loss, for instance, uh, but the new way robotic surgery takes a little bit uh, longer. So it, it's not dramatic as far as outcome for the patient is concerned, uh, but uh, perhaps for the surgery, uh, it is a, it is a dramatic uh, dramatic change. And one has to be a little bit uh, objective when they evaluate this data, because obviously this, these people these studies come from people that are fans of robotic surgery. They're surgeons that do robotic surgery, and therefore uh, they want it to. They want it to work. The big question, of course, is twofold robotic surgery. Does it take uh, a, a lot more time, and is that time uh, worth it? Well, the robotic surgeons think the time is worth it, and we, and we'll grant them that. And th and they say it doesn't take a lot more time. It does take more time because the instruments have to be set up. Uh, the uh, uh, the robot has to be banked uh, to the lapros laparoscope, and that takes more time. Perhaps the people that write about this are like me. If you ask me, does the robot take more time? Of course it doesn't take more time, because by the time I come into the room, everything's all set up. So I have no idea what happened before. I just sit down at the robot, and I'm ready to go. And uh, obviously, people have set it up, and it's taken uh, some time. Uh, is it cost effective? It's very hard to know whether it's cost effective or not. Obviously, these studies can show many things, but anything that costs $2 million and has to be amortized over a period of time definitely adds cost uh, to, this, uh, to this kind of procedure. But nevertheless, you can see here that the urology is growing dramatically. Uh, radical prostatectomies, now most are done with a robotic approach. Our field, you can see the bottom of the slide, is not growing uh, as dramatically. Now, this is just, uh, just in closing, some really far off stuff, but this is brain surgery, brain biopsies now, uh, done based on, based on image and based on a, a blind picture, combining CAT scan, MRI, and PET scanning uh, to localize the, uh, localize the tumor. So this uh, micro, uh, micro, uh, micro, micro robotic surgery is really kind of the field uh, and where it's, it's going and it's understanding uh, the biology. So what we talked about as far as innovations are concerned, uh, first we talked, about adhe we talked about adhesion formation. This is a wide open field. We need innovation here. Nothing's new and it seems like such an easy thing to come up with chemicals that could prevent raw surfaces from adhering to another. The robot is probably not a gimmick. It's probably an innovation that will be a lot around a long time if for no other reason that people have invested a lot of money. 3D, I think, is an offshoot of the robot, and I think that 3D surgery, uh, 3D television for the laparoscope, uh, I think is something also that will be part of what we do because it does make the surgery e easier. Better hemostasis, liquid hemostats uh, are important. They are getting better, and they allow us to do things. And imaging, of course, uh, and uh, invasive surgery, like an invasive cardiologist, as I mentioned, is really someplace that's going to become uh, 
uh, grow and grow, and perhaps the surgeons of the, of the future are the radiologists, not the, what we think are tra traditional, uh, traditional surgeons. And many invasive utilizing nanoparticles uh, to accomplish what we want, uh, tracking those nanoparticles, moving through the body, getting them where they want to be, and then activating them so that they do something, I think is very, very important. And this is all linked to personalized medicine, as we know better about signaling and how we can identify certain genes and certain tissues that produce certain proteins will be able to better treat uh, these patients. So on that note, I'll stop, and thanks for your attention.